before there was anything, before time or space or physical matter, there was God, one who was far beyond our ability to fully comprehend or describe. Through his story, we find that God is spirit, without a beginning or an end. He is complete within himself, lacking in nothing. He is all-knowing and all-wise. He is perfect in every way. He is not limited by anything. According to his story, God spoke all of creation into existence. By his word, he made everything out of nothing. The universe in which we live is made up of billions of huge star clusters called galaxies. Each galaxy contains millions and often billions of stars. One of these stars is the fiery sphere we call the Sun. Surrounding the Sun, there are nine very unique planets, including the one on which we live, the Earth. is an awesome display of beauty and diversity. It is a world ideally suited to sustain hundreds of thousands of different kinds of plants and animals. From the microscopic to the immense, each has its own color, sound, aroma, and texture. Each one has a special place in the delicate balance of life on this planet. It is mind-boggling to ponder the detail and dimension of the world around us. It is even more amazing to consider that there is one able to create it all. According to his story, God created the heavens, the earth, and every living thing in six days. And on the sixth day, after God had created everything else, he formed the first man out of the dust of the earth. Then, he breathed life into the man, and the man became a living being. God called him Adam. And from the very flesh of the man, God created the first woman. Adam called her Eve, and Adam and Eve were different from all of creation, for God created them in his own image. He did not create them to be gods, but as the moon reflects the light of the sun, so Adam and Eve were created to reflect the light of God. God blessed Adam and Eve and placed them in a beautiful garden in a land called Eden, where they had everything they needed. And on the seventh day, God paused from his work. Now, in the Garden of Eden, there were all kinds of trees, pleasing to the eye 
and good for food. In the middle of the garden, there were two trees. One was the tree of life, the other the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God told Adam he could eat from any tree in the garden, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil he must not eat, for when he does, he will surely die. Adam was given the freedom to choose, a freedom central to God's purpose, for man was created to love God and to be loved by God. And love is not truly love without the freedom to choose to love. So Adam had a choice to taste the fruit or not, a choice with a consequence, life or death. But Adam was not the first to have a choice with such great consequence. Before Adam breathed his first breath, God had created a multitude of spirit beings called angels. These creatures were given great strength and intelligence to serve God on earth and in a holy place called heaven. The most beautiful and powerful of all the angels was Lucifer. But Lucifer was not content to fulfill the purpose for which he was created. He wanted to take God's place. So Lucifer became God's enemy, leading a great number of angels to rebel against God. And so it was that Lucifer was cast down from his position of privilege before God. Those who followed Lucifer are now known as demons. And though they can disguise themselves as angels of light, they are evil to the core. Lucifer is now known by many names, including the deceiver, the devil, and Satan. Satan cannot defeat God, for God is all-powerful. And the day will come when Satan and all the demons will be thrown into the place of eternal torment God has prepared for them place called the Lake of Fire. But until then, Satan will do all he can to hurt God by attempting to destroy that which God loves. And so it was one day as Eve was walking in the garden near the tree of knowledge, that Satan spoke to her. She was without fear, for fear had not yet come into the world. Satan asked her about the forbidden fruit. He questioned God's warning and his motive toward man. Eve listened and began to doubt God. She considered the fruit and ate. Then she gave the fruit to Adam, and he ate. And immediately they were aware of their nakedness, and they were ashamed. Something terrible had happened. Something had changed. The evil in Satan was like an infectious disease. And through Adam's disobedience, this disease was released into the world. It is called sin. It is a power that works within a person to destroy his or her relationship with God, ultimately bringing death to all it touches. Adam and Eve had been created to live forever in perfect harmony with God. By eating the fruit, they acted independently from God, which is exactly what Satan had done. Now they would experience death, first spiritually, then physically. And through Adam, sin would be passed down from generation to generation, infecting all humankind to this very day. 
Though it cannot be seen, sin is the source of all selfishness and suffering. Adam and Eve tried to hide from God and to get rid of their shame by covering themselves with leaves. But this did not work, for their problem was not outward, but inward. Shame is the result of sin, and sin was at work in them like a poison. So God made for them garments of animal skin. This was an acceptable covering, but it was only a partial remedy, for it did not take away the sin. What's more, this covering required the death of an animal, something they had never seen. It was a horrible sight, a graphic lesson that sin brings death. And though they could not understand it at the time, it was a picture of the price God would ultimately pay to free humankind from sin. God sent Adam and Eve out from the garden, lest they eat from the tree of life and walk the earth forever, never knowing life as it was meant to be. As for Satan, God pronounced a judgment on him, and in that judgment, we find God's first promise that one day, through a descendant of Eve, God would send a deliverer to defeat Satan forever. As the descendants of Adam and Eve increased, so also sin increased. The earth became filled with evil, and God was grieved. But there was a man named Noah who followed God, and God gave Noah detailed instructions to build a huge boat called an ark. God sent a male and female of every kind of animal to enter the ark. And after Noah and his family were inside the ark, God closed the door. Then, God made it rain for 40 days and nights, flooding the whole earth and destroying everything that lived on the earth. For 150 days, water covered the earth, but Noah and his family and the animals were safe in the ark. When the water finally subsided, the ark came to rest on a mountain, and the animals went their own way. And so it was that Noah and his family escaped God's judgment of evil in the world. Not because they were without sin, but because they believed God. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and told them to be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth. The number of Noah's descendants increased greatly, but they remained as one people. They did not fill the earth as God commanded. Instead, they built a city. Then they built a tower reaching to the heavens. God was not pleased.
so God confused their language. Immediately, there were at least 70 groups of people who could not speak with each other. Then, God scattered these groups around the earth. And this was the beginning of the languages and nations of our world. From among the nations of the earth, God called out a man who was known to us as Abraham. God told Abraham to leave his home and go to the land he would show him. Abraham did as God said, taking all his people and possessions. God promised that Abraham would possess this land and become the father of a great nation. And through him, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. It was a peculiar promise, for Abraham and his wife Sarah had no children of their own. But Abraham obeyed God just the same and led his people to the land of Canaan. Now Abraham and Sarah lived in Canaan for a long time, but they remained childless. Don't be afraid, Abraham. I am with you. Again, God spoke to him, saying that his descendants would be like the stars of the heavens, too many to count. Abraham believed God, and God counted his faith as righteousness. I trust in you. No, I believe he will, he will bless us with a son. <laughs> But how could God's promise to Abraham be fulfilled? For Sarah to have a child seemed impossible. Rather than waiting on God and his timing, Sarah gave her servant Hagar to Abraham. And Hagar gave birth to a child named Ishmael. I name him Ishmael. <laughs> Eventually, just as God had promised, Sarah also bore a child from Abraham. A son. They called him Isaac. I have a son! I name him Isaac! What's he done? Take him away! They are brothers! And Sarah became bitter toward Hagar and Ishmael. Get out of my sight! Abraham was distressed. Abraham. But God told Abraham not to be troubled, for Ishmael would become the father of a great nation. And through Isaac, God would fulfill his promise to bless all nations. And the years passed. Now in those days, it was a custom of those who trusted God to sacrifice an animal as an act of worship. This practice dated back to the children of Adam and Eve, who most likely had heard of the animal that was slain to cover their father and mother. How would you make a burnt offering? And so it was one day that Abraham and his son prepared to make an offering to God. Abraham's son was now grown and probably had done this many times before. But this time was unlike any other. The day before, God had spoken to Abraham, telling him to take his son and offer him to God. Abraham was a man who obeyed God, but what was he thinking and feeling now? They had the wood and the knife, but where is the offering, his son asked. Abraham said, God will provide the lamb. The Lord himself will provide the lamb. And together they went to the appointed place. There, 
They prepared the altar and arranged the wood. God had not yet provided another offering. So Abraham bound his son on the altar. Still, there was no other sacrifice. So Abraham lifted his knife to slay his son. Then there came from heaven a voice saying, Do not lay a hand on the lad. And there in the thicket was a ram caught by its horns. And so it was that God provided an offering in place of Abraham's son. This was a picture of the offering that God would one day provide for the sin of humankind. God promised to bless Abraham and through him to bless all the nations of the earth. God made the same kind of promise to Abraham's son Isaac and to Isaac's son Jacob. Now after many years, Jacob had twelve sons, but there was one son named Joseph whom he loved very much. And Joseph's brothers were very jealous of him. Must we hear it? <laughs> So they seized Joseph and threw him in a pit. Then they sold Joseph to some traders who were going to a land called Egypt. The brothers dipped Joseph's clothing in blood and told their father that Joseph had been eaten by a wild beast. Joseph entered the land of Egypt as a slave. But in Egypt, God placed Joseph in the service of powerful people. And in time, Joseph was summoned to appear before the ruler of all Egypt, who was called the Pharaoh. Joseph was asked to interpret a dream. God gave Joseph the correct interpretation concerning a great famine that would come upon the earth. The Pharaoh was pleased with Joseph, and so it was that he placed Joseph in authority over the land of Egypt. To this man, bow to him! Now, when the famine came over the earth, Joseph's family suffered greatly in the land of Canaan. But in Egypt, Joseph had filled the storehouses. And even though Joseph had been betrayed by his brothers, he still had a deep love for his family. Because of the position God had given Joseph, his entire family was permitted to come and live in Egypt, my, escaping starvation. My son! My beloved son. <laughs> and so it was that a people through whom God promised to bless the nations came to dwell in a land that was not their own. <laughs> 350 years later, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were still in Egypt. They numbered about two million and had become known as the Hebrew people. By now, there was a new Pharaoh who feared that the Hebrew people had become too great. So he enslaved them. But they continued to increase. So he ordered the death of every son born into a Hebrew family. So be it. Most likely, Satan had a part in this plan, but God had a higher plan. And a Hebrew mother who trusted God 
laid her baby boy in a wicker basket and placed the basket in a river where the pharaoh's daughter bathed. When the pharaoh's daughter saw the Hebrew child, she took him in. The pharaoh's daughter adopted the boy as her own. She named him Moses. And this Hebrew child grew up as a prince of Egypt. On your feet! Now when Moses became a man, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. So he killed the Egyptian. Fearing punishment from the Pharaoh, Moses fled to the desert and he lived there as a shepherd for 40 years. Then one day, God appeared to Moses in a fire in the midst of a bush, yet the bush was not consumed. And God spoke to Moses from the bush. Moses, I am here. God told Moses to return to his people and lead them out of Egypt. God promised to be with him. Moses was afraid, but he obeyed God. Moses returned to Egypt, and with his brother Aaron, Moses went before the Pharaoh. But the Pharaoh's heart was hard toward the Hebrew people, and he refused to let them leave Egypt. So God sent a series of terrible plagues on Egypt. But none of the plagues touched the Hebrew people. After each plague, the Pharaoh still refused to let the people go. I will not let your people go. Then hear what God says. Then God commanded every Hebrew family to slay a lamb and place blood from the lamb over the door of their dwelling. And God sent death to every firstborn in the land, except those who were in a dwelling with blood over the entrance. As with Adam and Eve in the garden, and Abraham and his son on the mountain, it was yet another picture of how a sacrificial substitute would someday deliver humankind from Satan, sin, and death. Finally, the Pharaoh released the Hebrew nation, and the people went out of Egypt. But the Pharaoh had a change of heart. With his army, he pursued the Hebrew people to the edge of the sea. divided the sea for the Hebrew people to cross on dry land. And when the Egyptians pursued them, God caused the sea to return, drowning the whole army. From Egypt, God led the Hebrew people to a mountain in a desert called Sinai. It was here God said that if the Hebrew people obeyed him,
then they would be blessed as his treasured possession and they would represent him to all the nations of the earth. The people said they would do whatever God asked. And so it was with lightning and thunder and smoke and fire, God descended upon the mountain and Moses went up the mountain to meet with God. On tablets of stone, God wrote laws by which to live and be blessed. He gave them to Moses to give to the Hebrew people. It was a sacred trust, a holy calling, for these laws were the ways of God. Now God knew that because of the sin that had infected humankind, the people would not be able to keep these laws. So God told Moses how to build a sacred place where his presence would dwell among them, and the people could bring animals to be slain as offerings for sin. The blood of the animals would be as a covering so that God would not look upon their sin. By the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. But while these sacrifices covered sin, they did not take away the sin. In time, the Hebrew people filled the land of Canaan, which God had promised to their fathers. Over time, they developed a strong sense of identity with many traditions. In the main city of their land, Jerusalem, they built a sacred place known as the Temple. It was here they offered sacrifices to cover their sins. For over a thousand years, the Hebrew people attempted to live as God had commanded them. But many times, they drifted away from God sometimes even following false gods. When they did not turn back to God, he would discipline them, often by sending a foreign nation to invade their land and rule over them. The Hebrew people would then acknowledge their unfaithfulness and call to God for deliverance. God would then raise up a leader to free the people from their oppressors, and the people would renew their commitment to live according to the ways of God. From blessing to bondage, to blessing to bondage, over and over, again and again, the Hebrew people had been called to show the world what God was like. But because of the sin that infected the world, they could not walk in the ways of God without falling. In the Garden of Eden, God promised to send a deliverer. Through Hebrew prophets, God gave hundreds of promises concerning this deliverer, who would one day conquer Satan, sin, and death forever. In the temple, the smoke from sacrifices ascended day after day, year after year, generation after generation, giving the Hebrew people a constant reminder of humankind's need for the Deliverer. But when would he come? How would he come? By now, some must have wondered if he would come at all. After thousands of years of watching and waiting, it finally happened. One night in the city of Nazareth, a young woman named Mary had an unexpected visitor
An angel from God told her she would bear a son and that she was to name him Jesus, which means the Lord is our deliverance. Now being a Hebrew, Mary most probably knew of the promised deliverer. She was astounded and puzzled. How can this be, she asked, for I am a virgin. The angel told her that the Spirit of God would come upon her and the child would be conceived and he would be called the Son of God. God's plan was unfolding. But who could have ever imagined it would happen like this? From the ancient promises of God, one might have considered that to overcome sin, the Deliverer would be without sin, just as God is without sin. But who would have expected that the Deliverer promised by God throughout the ages would be God himself in human form. That's too much to believe. Now, Mary was promised to be wed to a Hebrew man named Joseph. But you're not any man. When Joseph learned that Mary was with child, he was troubled. But an angel came to Joseph in a dream and told him that this child was conceived of the Spirit of God and that he would deliver his people from their sins. So Joseph took Mary as his wife and he kept her as a virgin until the child was born. In those times, the land of the Hebrews was occupied by a foreign army that answered to a ruler far away. This ruler ordered that a census be taken and that all the people register in their place of origin. So Joseph and Mary, who was now close to giving birth, left their home and traveled a great distance to a little town called Bethlehem. But Bethlehem was very crowded, and there was no bed for Mary. So they found shelter in a stable. And so it came to pass that the promised Deliverer, the Son of God, came into the world as an infant born in the most humble of settings. Hundreds of years earlier, Hebrew prophets foretold that a virgin would give birth to a son who would one day rule over the Hebrew people. Of this child it was said, his goings forth are from long ago from the days of eternity. And just as Mary had been told, they named the child Jesus. Guilty in the stars! I'll bring down their stars. Now, there was a king named Herod who had been given limited authority by the foreign power that ruled over the land of the Hebrews. Herod was an evil man, and having heard of this child who was said to be a king, Herod decreed that all male children two years of age and under in the area of Jesus' birth be put to death. But your majesty, kill them all! Now before this terrible thing occurred, an angel told Joseph to take Jesus to Egypt and to remain there until God told him to return. 
Just as God delivered the baby Moses from the plans of an evil ruler, Jesus was also delivered from an evil ruler so that one day he might deliver humankind from sin. Look, do you see Nazareth? After returning to the land of the Hebrews, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus settled in the city of Nazareth. As a boy, Jesus grew in strength and wisdom. Even the Hebrew teachers were amazed at his understanding of the things of God. And when Jesus spoke of God, he called him Father. The grace of God was upon Jesus, and he had favor with those who knew him. As Jesus grew from child to man, he remained without sin. And when Jesus was about 30 years of age, there was a man named John who was full of passion for God. Bring no more vain offerings, saith the Lord. Proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven was near, John called the people to live according to the ways of God. Any one of these stones and turn it. When people accepted John's challenge to live for God, they participated in a practice called baptism. This was done to express purification and commitment to live according to God's laws. Open up your heart. Be ready for the coming of the kingdom. Hundreds of years earlier, Hebrew prophets foretold that someone like John would be sent by God to prepare the way for the deliverer. John would be the first to speak of Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so it was one day that Jesus came to John. Knowing who Jesus was, John asked to be baptized by him. It is I who, who need baptism from you. But the time for baptism in the name of Jesus had not yet come. And Jesus was baptized by John. And when Jesus came up from the water, the Spirit of God descended upon him, and a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus then departed to the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. But Jesus would resist, and Satan would flee. This wilderness encounter was a test. And just as a precious metal is tested to prove its nature, this test was further proof that Jesus was indeed the Son of God, come to earth to do the will of his Father. After resisting Satan, Jesus came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. Soon, people began to follow after Jesus. Most of these followers were common, ordinary people. I am Andrew of Capernaum. But they saw something very uncommon and extraordinary in Jesus. Some left the security of their livelihoods to be with Jesus. Some of these were fishermen, to whom Jesus said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Stay with us. From those who followed him, Jesus chose an inner group of twelve. These became known as his disciples, and for nearly three years they traveled with him, 
and learned from him. They began to see the world through his eyes. As with everyone who follows Jesus, these men were being prepared for something far beyond anything they could imagine. The kingdom of heaven is like a tree. As Jesus and his disciples journeyed through the land, people gathered around him. He was a master communicator. With wonderful stories and illustrations, Jesus taught people the ways of God and called them to live according to those ways. The kingdom of heaven is here. Now it's the time for joy. Jesus had compassion for the outcast and the brokenhearted. He convicted those whose hearts were full of pride. He spoke with the authority of one sent from God. But he was not just a man of words. Jesus expressed his compassion and proved his authority with miracles. He was reported to have calm storms and walked on the sea. On two occasions, he took just a few loaves of bread and a handful of fish and multiplied them to feed thousands of people. Jesus gave sight to the blind, caused the lame to walk, and healed people of horrible diseases. demons out of people leave him and he even raised people from the dead for 30 years Jesus had lived in obscurity but now he was demonstrating his power over the physical and the spiritual world over life and death News of Jesus spread quickly throughout the land. Hundreds of years earlier, a Hebrew prophet wrote that with the coming of God's promised deliverer, the blind would see, the deaf would hear, the lame would leap like a deer, those who could not speak would shout for joy, and good news would be proclaimed. Some whose hope was set on God's promised deliverer, were asking, Is Jesus the one? Many were not as concerned with who he was as with what he could do for them. And others, such as the Hebrew religious leaders, did not know what to think about this man of miracles. <laughs> Rabbi. These religious leaders began looking for opportunities to question Jesus. Some of these leaders were sincere men who sought to know God through their religion. But others were pretentious and arrogant. Their religion had become their God. They did not like it that many of the people esteemed Jesus more highly than themselves. Their intent was to discredit Jesus. They questioned by what authority he performed miracles. They criticized him for associating with people whom they considered unclean. You can't come in! This is no place for the likes of you! What's the matter? Yes, yes, yes it's her. What does 
she doing? <laughs> but of all the things that Jesus did, the thing that seemed to anger them the most was when he told people their sins were forgiven. And I know there are many. For only God has the authority to forgive sin. By claiming to do what only God could do, Jesus was in fact claiming to be God, an act that, according to Hebrew law, was punishable by death. Go and sin no more. As the controversy around Jesus increased, he began explaining to his disciples the true nature of his mission. And who do you say that I am? He told them that soon he would be given over to the religious leaders and killed. Three days later, he would rise from the dead. His disciples heard what he was saying but they could not bring themselves to embrace the full meaning of his words. Now every year, the Hebrew people had a celebration called Passover. Many journeyed great distances to observe Passover in the city of Jerusalem. This time was set aside to remember how God delivered the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt. When the Pharaoh refused to let the people go, God sent death to every firstborn child in Egypt, but he passed over those who were in a dwelling with the blood of a lamb over the entrance. They were covered by the blood. And so it came to pass that Jesus, whom John called the Lamb of God, went up to Jerusalem to observe Passover. By now, Jesus had become so well known that the people celebrated his arrival. They shouted, Hosanna, which means save us now. This is the only time Jesus ever allowed such a reception on his behalf. But he had a reason. He knew the religious leaders would not be pleased. He was moving them one step closer to their part in a plan that had been established before time. Come to me. In the days preceding the Passover, Jesus continued to minister to the people. The religious leaders watched him carefully. A few of them were drawn to Jesus. Most of them simply wanted him out of the way. Over the years, the religious leaders added hundreds of laws to the laws that God had given Moses. This man! Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! When Jesus openly confronted these religious leaders, for the way in which they made it difficult for people to follow God, the tension increased. How can any of you escape damnation? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For I and my Father are one and the same. He is the blasphemer! The religious leaders could no longer put off the matter of dealing with Jesus. So they called a meeting. They feared that if Jesus was allowed to continue stirring up the people, then the foreign power that ruled over their land might step in, taking away their place as leaders. The question before them now was not if they should do away with Jesus, but rather how. So they devised a plan. Meanwhile, Jesus gathered his disciples to celebrate Passover. This is my body. Taking the Passover bread, Jesus broke it and said, This is my body, 
which is given for you. Then he took the wine, which represented the blood of the Passover lamb, which had been placed over the entrances of the Hebrew dwellings. And he said, This is my blood, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Now Jesus knew that Satan had put a plan of betrayal into the heart of one of his disciples. So Jesus sent him away to do what was in his heart. Jesus remained with the other disciples, speaking to them of things to come. He said that soon he must go to the Father to prepare a place for them in heaven, and that while he was gone, they would be persecuted. But Jesus said they should not worry, for the Spirit of God would come to be their helper and comforter. And at the proper time, Jesus would return for them, and they would be together forever. After saying these things, Jesus prayed, and they all departed to a nearby garden. Not long after being there, the disciples fell asleep. But Jesus agonized in prayer, knowing what was about to take place. Out of the darkness came the disciple who had betrayed Jesus. With him, there were religious leaders and armed guards. Judas! What's happening? You traitor! No! When one of his disciples attempted to defend Jesus, Jesus stopped him, saying that he could easily summon thousands of angels to his defense. Take him away! And Jesus went with them of his own will. Jesus was then taken to a meeting of the religious leaders for questioning. All of their interrogation finally came down to one question. Are you, Are you the Son of God? Jesus answered, Yes, I am. I am. Hearing this, they accused Jesus of committing a sin deserving death, and they rose up and took Jesus to the foreign governor who ruled over their land. Now Jesus had spoken often of the kingdom of God. So the governor asked him, Are you a king? Are you a king? Jesus said that his kingdom is not of this world. The governor said to the religious leaders, This man has done nothing deserving of death. But the religious leaders continued to seek the death of Jesus, claiming he was a threat to the people and the governor. Jesus did not defend himself. The governor was amazed. And not wanting to condemn Jesus, the governor proposed another way. I've made my decision. It was an accepted custom to release one prisoner during Passover. The governor wanted to release Jesus, but the religious leaders urged him to release another, one who was known to be a murderer and a thief. Hoping to appease them and end the matter, the governor turned Jesus out to be beaten. After beating Jesus severely, the soldiers dressed him with the scarlet robe. Then they made a crown of thorns and placed it on him and began mocking him, saying, Hail, King of the Hebrews! Majesty! 
Jesus was then returned to the governor, who still wished to release him. But the religious leaders continued to seek the death of Jesus. By now, a crowd had gathered outside, so the governor went out and asked the crowd what should be done with Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. But the crowd, having been stirred up by the religious leaders, shouted, Crucify him! Having allowed the people to choose, the governor handed Jesus over to be put to death. They laid upon Jesus a heavy wooden beam, and they took him to a place outside the city where criminals were killed. After nailing Jesus to the wood, they lifted him up to die. Over him, they placed a sign indicating that on this cross hangs the king of the Hebrew people. The religious leaders objected, but the soldiers followed the governor's orders. The sign remained. Some reviled him, others mourned. Yet through it all, Jesus did not say a harsh word. Instead, speaking to his Father in heaven, he said, Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. For three hours, darkness fell over the land. It seemed so senseless, and yet, it made perfect sense. God is righteous and just and pure. He could not accept the evil that entered the world through Satan, nor can he accept the evil that entered humankind through Adam, for to do so would violate his character and corrupt his nature. But God is also love. He created people to love them and to be loved by them. And for God to judge people for the evil in them would be to destroy the very objects of His love. This was a dilemma of divine proportions. But according to His story, this moment had been planned before creation and predicted throughout the ages. At the cross, Jesus took our sin upon himself. He paid the penalty for our sin. He became our substitute. At the cross, God's justice was satisfied and his love fulfilled. Then Jesus said, It is accomplished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. After making certain that Jesus was dead, the soldiers allowed his body to be taken down from the cross. By the end of the day, his body would be laid in a tomb, which would be sealed with a very large stone. At the insistence of the religious leaders, soldiers would be posted to guard the tomb. For those who loved Jesus, this was a time of great confusion and loss. On the morning of the third day, after Jesus had been crucified, a group of women went to visit the tomb. They were not the first. Earlier that morning, an angel of God descended from heaven. The soldiers guarding the tomb 
were struck with fear, and the angel moved the stone that sealed the entrance. Where are you going? Jesus is not there. Impossible. I had guards here. The tomb was empty. Just as he promised, Jesus had risen from the dead. The religious leaders offered the soldiers a large sum of money to say that in the night, Jesus' followers had taken the body. They promised that if this matter came before the governor, they would win him over and keep the soldiers from trouble. The soldiers took the money, but the truth could not be silenced. But I'm sent off to learn. All you were fit for, perhaps. What have you learned? Over the next 40 days, Jesus physically appeared to many people. With some, he walked and talked. With others, he shared a meal. In one instance, he appeared before more than 500 people. He opened their minds to understand the events that had taken place in light of all that had been spoken through the prophets from ages past. He explained that for the forgiveness of sins, it was necessary that he suffer death and rise again. And he spoke of the kingdom of God saying that all authority in heaven and on earth had been given to him. Your captivity is over. Now the time had come for Jesus to go to the Father and prepare a place in heaven for all those who love him. Jesus promised his followers that soon the Spirit of God would come and empower them to share his truth and love and forgiveness with the whole world. After saying this, Jesus left them and ascended into the clouds. Not many days after Jesus had ascended to heaven, his followers were gathered together. Suddenly, there came from heaven a noise like a rushing wind, filling the whole house. There must be a storm coming. They saw what appeared to be tongues of fire, which came to rest on each person. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit of God and began speaking in languages other than their own. Just as Jesus had promised, his followers were not alone, for his very presence was being manifested in them by the Spirit of God filling them. Outside in the streets, there were people from many nations, and each one of them, in their own language, heard the followers of Jesus declaring the wonders of God. And from that day, his followers went out into the world, sharing God's truth and love and forgiveness with others. In the name of the Lord, by His Spirit, rise. they did the works that Jesus did when He walked among them, healing the sick, casting out evil spirits, and reconciling people to God. And their number increased daily. And so it has been from that time to this very day, 
Whenever a person turns in faith to Jesus as the sacrificial Lamb of God and the risen Lord of all, their sins are forgiven and the Spirit of God comes into them, bringing eternal life. Those who have decided to follow Jesus have grown in number to include hundreds of millions of people. And according to God's story, the time will come when His followers will include people from every tribe and nation under heaven. Then, Jesus will return, just as He promised. Those who have rejected Jesus throughout the ages will be forever separated from God in the place that was prepared for Satan and his followers. Those who have trusted Jesus will know life as it was meant to be with God forever. You have now heard what many have called the greatest story ever told. But if it is really true, then it's not just a story. It's something much more with incredible meaning for all of us. Now, there are other stories about God and man. They also claim to be true, but this story is different. Now, other stories tell about people who supposedly found their way to God. This story tells us it is impossible for people to make a way to God. But God loved the world so much that He came to us. Through this story, we learn about a deadly spiritual disease that came into the world through the disobedience of Adam, the first man created by God. This disease, called sin, is an evil power that separates people from God bringing death to all it touches. From generation to generation, sin has been passed down, infecting every person to this very day. But through this story, we also learn that from the very beginning, God had a plan to send a deliverer who one day would free us from sin and death forever. As God provided the covering for Adam, the ark for Noah, the ram for Abraham, and the Passover lamb for the Hebrew people, so also God has provided freedom from sin through a deliverer. But who could have imagined that this deliverer would be God himself in human form? Jesus. He became one of us. He lived among us. He felt our pain. And so that we might live with Him forever, He gave His life to pay the penalty for our sin. Then He proved that He is who He claimed to be by overcoming death. Jesus is unlike any other. And He desires to make His story your story. He's inviting you to come and follow Him. He is offering you help for today and hope for tomorrow. His invitation will not be open forever, but it is open for you now. Won't you say yes? If you want to know and follow Jesus, then simply tell Him so. Confess to Him your need for forgiveness. Acknowledge your trust in Him as the one who died for your sins, so you might be restored to your Heavenly Father who loves you. Receive the Spirit of God and allow Him to direct your life. In doing this, your deepest longings will be fulfilled, and you will bring glory to God.